All right, I'm delighted to be joined on the line by Cora Staunton, who is back from Australia, the women's AFL league curtailed. Um, I think, Cora, you've managed to make it back to Mayo? Yeah, I did, yeah. Um, I'm back in Mayo since uh, last Friday, so I think this is day five in self-isolation, so um, getting a bit bored, bored as of now. The jet lag is finally over, so yeah, back in, back in Mayo for now, and um, yeah, in probably getting to enjoy this, this good weather, which um, is well due when you're in self-isolation. Yeah, so you're only, you're only back a few days then. Had, were you in two minds about whether or not you'd come home? Yeah, I was. Initially, I had planned to stay in um, Australia um, after the season. We're contracted up till um, the end of um, April with different things. The season, obviously, the grand final was meant to be played, I think, around the 15th, 16th. And then we've exit interviews and uh, awards night and stuff. So we're contracted up to the 1st of May. So I was due to come home sometime uh, middle of May. Um, yeah, so it's probably about six or seven weeks later than I anticipated. But um, probably in a little bit of two minds, but it was probably the right thing to come home. Obviously, Sydney is in a bit of a lockdown there as well, and a lot of the girls that are um, that are that I play with in the club have also gone home. We have a lot of girls from interstate, so majority of them have gone back to their home. So yeah, um, obviously the club um, done all the booking of flights and getting us home. So yeah, glad to be home now and um, you know back into to normality here in in Kernicon. Yeah, so for well as normal as it can be, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's it's quite different. Obviously, um, you know, struggling. Haven't really seen anyone. Haven't um, just seen my sister and her, um, my nieces. That's about it. Haven't seen my dad. Obviously, because he has to be. We have to be wary of him and watch him. So after the fourteen days, hopefully, I'll get to see a few more of my family and, and a few more of my friends. But um, yeah, kind of keeping quiet, just keeping myself busy. Um, yeah. Doing some reading and doing a lot of exercise in the home gym in the garage. I imagine your dad was keen to get home. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he, um, you know, he probably struggled with the first while of um, all this pandemic and having to stay inside and stuff. Um, but like we're lucky enough, we live in the country. He's on a farm, and you know, there's plenty of uh, green green grass here and, and, and fields to go into and cycles to do and stuff to get outside. So, you know, we're look, one of the lucky ones. We're not living in a small apartment in in a city. So, um, yeah, he he was keen to get me home for sure. So maybe for people who weren't following and, and just saw bits and pieces of what happened towards the end of the women's AFL season and actually maybe viewing figures were quite high because I think it was still ongoing when there was little or nothing else going on around the world. There seemed to be a, a different attitude in Australia and maybe they're right because it does seem as though that the death rate in, in Australia isn't quite where it is with some of the other big nations. When did you get a sense as players that something was happening here and that season was going to change? You were what? You were probably three quarters of the way through the season, was it? Yeah, so um, we played um, our last game around six um, in the in the normal season. Um, we played Adelaide um, in Adelaide. So it was probably that week because we went to Adelaide. There was no crowds at our match for that for that game. Um, and there, it was just, you know, we going to the airport and stuff. It was very, like, we had our own rooms and hotels and everything was very... Um, hygiene based and, and to look after yourself when we, we have our own space in the airplane and um, in the airport with our own part in the lounge where we'd kind of stay away from everyone so kind of around six and we had different talks with the AFLPA so they're like the GPA um, around what was going to happen with the season um, that they didn't think that the season season could go go as normal and if it can't what, what would it be so as players we had a big um, teleconference with all the um, women's players in the AFLPA won one night and the same night the men's um, AFL players had had a, their teleconference with all the 18 teams on that as well and just deciding what had happened so there was obviously a different scenarios we had two more rounds to play in, in the normal season um, and then we had the final series which ran over three weeks so um, that was obviously five weeks at the time and obviously we had we had people from the uh, chief medical officer from Victoria on the, on the call basically telling us how, how he th thinks this pandemic was going to go and what should happen. And at that time when we had that, he was saying, you know, in four, you, you might get another four weeks out of it um, that the pandemic will, will start to really hit Australia, but they can't be sure. So as players, we had a chance to vote and decide what we wanted to do. And there was, I think, four different options. One was go straight to a grand final between the top two teams in the conference. Another one was um, continue the season as normal, and if it ends, it ends. Um, and then another one was top three and top four. So originally it should be top three that will qualify for the final, and then the final series would go on. So um, in the end, it was decided that top four um, would go finish the competition. The last two rounds were null and void, 
and the top four teams would play in um, a knockout competition. So which happened? Obviously, we played in the in our in our um, semi final or knock quarter final, if you want to call it, um, and th that was the last round of the game. So. Um, it didn't finish after that. Once that game was finished, it was announced by uh, Gil McLaughlin, the AFL uh, CEO, that the men's and women's season um, women's season was can cancelled and the men's season was postponed till at least the 31st of May. And that last game you played with Greater Western Sydney, which was essentially a quarter final, I guess, was that played yeah. behind closed doors? Yeah, so that was played at our home stadium in, in the Sydney Olympic Park uh, Giant Stadium. So that was yeah, that was also played behind closed doors. Um, and again, that was kind of very touch and go if that would, would go ahead. As I said, that was on a Saturday and on the Sunday the AFL announced after our men played that Saturday night and there's a round of men's AFL games and women's games on the Sunday. That Sunday afternoon was announced that it was, it was going to be shut down and the women's competition was going to be uh, cancelled. So just on that teleconference you were talking about where you had all the various different stakeholders involved, what was that conversation like? Was, it, was there any pressure on the players to play or was the health and safety of the players the number one priority? Because there is so much money involved in all of this, both in the women's AFL and even more so in the men's AFL. There's huge broadcasting deals that need to be satisfied. There is the ability of clubs to be able to pay wages and they need that revenue that comes from the match day experience. But did you get a sense at any stage that no matter what happened, that they wanted players out there? No, not at all. I think it was it was probably nearly the opposite. I think the players were very keen to play. I suppose in the women's um, game, especially, it's such a short season, and you, you know we were kind of coming to the the closing stages of the season. As for us and the Giants, it would have been our first time. We like with two rounds to go, we were qualified for the final series, um, you know, and after that, it was where we'd finish on the in in the conference. So there was no pressure at all on players to play. It was. Probably a unique experience with probably what 420 players and you know Paul Marsh, the AFLPA CEO, and then the chief medical officer on it. Um, no, but they just wanted to give us all you know all the information that was possible and to make a decision from that. And at the end of the day, it wasn't going to be the AFL that was probably going to make the decision anyways. It was going mm. to be the, the the prime minister of Australia and the government that made the decision finally. But um, no, certainly at all the health of the players all the time you know was paramount and how well you were looked after in that all time. Um, everything was done within the club, you know, um, to, to help us. As far as we've three different programs running the club, we've the men's um, AFL, we've the netball team, and we've the AFLW. And then three um, groups were even uh, split. We, we went to a different training base in, in Spotless Stadium for kind of the last two weeks of training to make sure there was no, you know, crossover between the groups. Um, so everything was done at the, at the highest level. I said even when we went to Adelaide, certain things like we were had our own, um, we'd be the last on the, on the flight, we'd be in, you know, separating the flight from other passengers, we'd um, had the, the lounge to ourselves before we boarded, um, and, you know, hotel rooms, and mm. when we stayed away in Adelaide, you had your, your own room, so the, the health of the players is paramount, to, paramount, it was never that, but I think it was the, the eagerness of, I suppose, the players to try and finish the season, because it's such a short season, but, you know, obviously that didn't happen, and, you know, this is um, a once in, in a lifetime, um, probably health crisis and you know you just have to understand that and get on with it. And what was that last game like playing in front of an empty stadium? Yeah I suppose we played the week before against Adelaide so there was two games that was empty. Yeah it's, it's a little bit different but um, I suppose it's probably not as a, as big of a thing for um, for a women's team because we obviously don't have as big a crowd as the men but yeah it was very strange the two last games are very very strange when you have nobody at the games um, but I suppose once you get into the to the once the ball is thrown up and you get into the game, you kind of forget about that. But it, yeah, it is a little bit strange. Um, certainly, probably more so in the in the first game than the second game because we obviously had been through that the week before. Mm. So the season ended up being cancelled. You lost the quarterfinal, if we if we called it that. So maybe it didn't make any huge difference in the end to you personally that the season was cancelled. Yeah, no, I mean, you'd still like to probably see it finished out. Mm. And yeah, you'd obviously like to have played it out normal and played all the rounds and. Um, see, you know, how the knockout si si our system goes in. But yeah, we were unfortunately defeated very, um, we did, you know, in the end we lost by, I think, uh, two points and, you know, we're winning the game for most of the game and Melbourne kicked three goals in the last six minutes. So yeah, we're hugely disappointed how, how it finished off um, for us because it was our first time making finals. But, you know, we've made huge progress in the last um, two seasons, um, especially going off last year. So 
from that point of view, um, we probably haven't had huge time to reflect on it because that was Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, and, and by Monday the club was shut down. So what we normally have is we have team reviews and individual reviews and medical exits and stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, the only thing we had this time was our medical exits with physios and doctors, but that was all done online. We haven't been allowed back into the club um, as per AFL rules. There's certainly been a lot of talk and looking online over the last couple of days and what's happening in the sporting sphere in Australia of how financially damaging this is going to be for the men's AFL. That financially it could be catastrophic in terms of the damage that the lack of game time and in terms of broadcast deal sponsorship and, and match day revenue. Have you been able to get any sense of how that's going to feed down to the women's AFL and, and how damaging this could be? Yeah, I suppose we're, you know, again, we're regularly updated by our own CEO of the club. He sends emails probably once a week and we're regularly updated through the AFLPA. And I think AFLW is um, is a huge thing for, for the AFL system. And, you know, I think they're very keen to keep that going. You know, the growth of AFLW over the last um, four seasons has been massive. Um, and the growth of AFLW, um, young girls playing it over there, the, the numbers and the rates... Um, you know, gone through the roof in Sydney alone or New South Wales alone. You know, the, it's increased by I think more than 150 percent. So, the numbers are massive. So I, I don't. Yeah, in some ways it will be affected. I, I still think there'll be a competition. Um, staff and, and how many people work within the program might be scaled back um, a little bit. But I do think it's you know it's it's one of the huge growth areas of AFL. And Gil McLaughlin, the CEO, uh, has certainly said that you know going forward he sees AFLW um, for what it'll look like next year. You know, I, 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 it's very hard to know. I, th I think it'll certainly there'll be a league and there'll still be 14 teams, whether it'll have the staff that normally works on it, you know, who knows. But, um, I think the AFL over there is probably one of the sports, um, while, while they're suffering, that has, um, compared to the NRL and, and other sports, they have um, um, been very pro proactive in, you know, trying to have a solution to the problem, you know, they, and they were lucky, I think it was a couple of years ago, they um, purchased um, a stadium in Melbourne called um, Marvel Stadium, it used to be called Etihad, and, and I think they've been using that as their, um, you know, to have that, to own that real, real estate in, in Melbourne, they've been using it obviously um, to, to get bank loans, and they acquired mm -hmm. a 600 million um, loan from NAB, and um, bank over there so you know they know they're they're kind of for the future they're, they're lucky that they have that so they're one of the probably the better um, set up organizations for the future because of um, the work that they've been doing um, and they still hope to play a lot of the seasons I think they have 10 different scenarios that you know if the season goes ahead for the men um, you know there's talks about could be even a New Year's Eve grand final if right. need be so they have different things I know the latest one is that they're um, going to look to play um, it in three three different areas of um, Australia, Tasmania, Adelaide, and Perth, and you know have six teams go to them areas and play play against each other and move around. And um, so yeah, they're they're very very smart and they'll do everything they can possible um, to to make sure it works for them and, and try and get some game time. And what's your personal situation then? Is with your contract? Is your intention very much when all this dies down to go back? Uh, yeah, that's probably, um, I haven't really thought about that much. Normally, um, this time of year, once you, once the season is finished, you do sign and trade period, which is meant to be which is meant to be from the 15th of April. That's been extended out now till at least the 31st of May. Um, so you don't have to sign back on till um, at least the 31st of May or afterwards. So, uh, you know, I had a little um, walk and a coffee with our um, coach before I came home on, on last Friday and, you know, We'll, um, as I said to him, I'll see how the body and the mind is in, in a couple of months' time. Or, you know, I'll have a couple of chats to him over the next, you know, eight to ten weeks and, and, and see how things are. I suppose it's been quite a long, um, hard road for me over the, the last 11 months, you know, with the leg break and, and trying to get back to playing football. So I think it's a little bit of time to reflect and, and, and you know, um, give the mind and body a little bit of a break and, and see where I'm at um, come maybe 10 or 12 weeks' time. Yeah, let's talk about the mind and the body then. And, and maybe even just the last two or three weeks first with the mind. Like, how's your head been? How have you dealt with this crisis? Because it's, I think it's affected everybody worldwide, the stress and the anxiety that it's brought about. How have you dealt with it, particularly when for, so, for the initial stages you were so, so far away from home? Yeah, um, I, I think it's a little bit different in Australia. I think Australia are probably a little bit behind Europe and behind Ireland and how it's, how it's over there. 
I think they've quite, quite kind of dealt with it quite well. I think they're only on 50 deaths, um, you know, and for a, a population, I think of about 25,000, that's quite, quite good. You know, they're having low numbers of deaths every day and I'm sure that'll increase because they're, they're far behind. But I think it's a little bit more relaxed over there. You could still get out and about. You could still go out and walk and do your exercise and coffee shops are still open and, um, you know, you could still probably get about your daily business. People are working from home a lot, all right, but... Um, it's probably not as gone as strict as it was that it was here. Um, now that I'm sure that will change. But yeah, at times I suppose you, you, you're a little bit fearful, you know, initially when it kicked off that, oh God, will I get home? People are talking about, oh, there won't be flights and stuff. But again, the club reassured us and, and said it's our duty to get you home. And, you know, I knew one of the guys in the Irish Embassy, he, he's a huge Giants fan um, and I've met him at a couple of Giants games. So I had been in contact with him and, he, you know, he reassured me there'd be no problem getting home. So... Yeah, I was, you know, at at start maybe when when it kicked off and everyone was kind of moving moving back to the, their home places, you got a little bit anxious. But after that, you know, I was reassured that the flights were going every day and it was, uh, you were going to get home. So, um, yeah, obviously trying to get back into um, life here and to, to the different weather and stuff, and um, it's been a, a little bit of a change and being, you know, stuck in self isolation and um, not being able to do too much. You know, it's it's yeah, a little bit hard, but. It's, yeah, I'm getting used to it now, five days in. Yeah, it, it really has been a stop-start spell in Australia between this following on from the injury. They, did, have you felt that you made Australia home at any stage? Like, have there been periods when you've been there where you thought, actually, you know, when all this is over, I may actually just stay put. And, you know, maybe Mayo was in the past. There's a new life for me here. Uh, yeah, there's times. Obviously, last year was probably had the longest spell. I was there probably uh, nearly 11 months, obviously, after I broke my leg. I was due home and then I obviously had to stay on. So the last term I was out, you know, I only had, I think I was only home for about nine and a half weeks and I was back out again. So, um, yeah, certainly the last term, you know, while it was difficult from the point of view of the injury, yeah, yeah I, I do love it when I'm out there. Um, you know, I, I, it does feel like home. Obviously, um, when I leave, when I leave Ireland to go back to Australia, it's it's tough. But once I'm out there, I feel very settled and and love the place. You know, I suppose the only big difficult thing it's it's so far from home. And if you do need to come home in in a for for any reason in an emergency or a crisis, that's probably the only draw that you, you kind of get. But you know, anytime I'm out there, I feel very much like it's it's part of me now. And you know, obviously, I'm had have done three years out there with the club, so. You know, there is a there is a draw to it, and um, you know, I, I do love the place and I love the people out there. And you know, I, I actually love the freedom. It's probably a little bit different to live in here. Um, as I said before, you're you're not known, and you can just you can just go around and be whoever you want to be. And you know, I, I suppose I enjoy that side of it. You must be incredibly proud of the way you've come back from the broken leg. Was it a triple break? Like at the age of thirty-seven. I'd imagine there were physios and doctors and consultants who were saying, you know what, the best thing is hang up the boots. Players of your age don't come back from this. Like, what, did those kind of type of conversations happen? No, in fairness, um, my consultant, yeah, he um, he was a great guy. He was, you know, and it's an I said he was, you know, he probably agreed with me or he said, no, it's possible. He probably thought I was mad, but he didn't tell me that. Um, yeah, so I, what had happened is I, I broke my leg in three places. So I broke my tibia in two places and I broke my fibia in one and then I had a break in my ankle. So it was four breaks all together. Um, so yeah, obviously when it happened, you know, the enormity of it, yeah, probably didn't probably hit home. But um, after the first couple of days um, in hospital and getting out home, you know, I decided this is going to be another challenge and, you know, I'll hit it hit it or you know I'm going to um, hit it head on and try to try to do my best to get back whether that will happen or not who knows but you know I, I can't enough thank the people that I worked with in the Giants are just very lucky we have a, probably one of the best strength and conditioning coaches in, in the competition um, who decided me to take to take me under her wing and she, she was going to use it as a challenge for herself as well um, and you know some of the, my physios as well especially I had one there in the Giants that worked with me um, you know, for the whole time I was out there, and I've seen her twice a week. So I've seen, seen my strength conditioning coach six times a week. So yeah, once they seen, they probably knew the person I was from the two years that they have worked with me. Um, and yeah, I, I do think them two were probably two that never doubted that I wouldn't get back. There was probably loads of other people that did, but um, did you ever doubt think, yourself? Uh, there's probably doubts. There was probably doubts at times, you know, when you you cannot do simple things like walk properly, or you can't jog properly, or you can't hop on one leg. Um, you do get frustrated, and 
there there was probably a little bit self doubt at that time. Um, but no, probably not. I probably knew if I put in the hard work and the surgeon is telling me it's possible to come back. Um, then I probably knew, you know, it was possible. I knew it was going to be very hard. Um, but you know, I've I've been through injuries before and I've been through other stuff that you know you, you get through it and you know hard work and and gets you through a lot of a lot of different things and, and fortunately that's that's what got me through and, and got me back on the pitch. And is there a moment when you're back on the pitch when you think I am back? You know, I've taken the heavy haste. I've I've come through it. I've walked away from it. This you know all that pain and suffering and and hard work. It was it, it was all worth it. Yeah, there was obviously when I went back, um, I came home, as I said, for about nine and a half weeks. And I struggled when I was at home because obviously I came back to Ireland without having my strength conditioning coach and physio. And it was dark. It was October time. And you're trying to, um, you know, do do rehab and do runs in, in, in down in Ballantubber. And it's dark and there's no lights and people are wondering who's this lunatic out running. So I found it hard probably towards the end of being home to motivate myself to do my program. But, Obviously, I'd always do it. Um, and, you know, once I'd done that, I went back to Australia. I was probably, in some ways, not wanting to go back and in other ways needing to go back because I needed to see wh- where I was at with my physio and strength conditioning coach. So eventually I went back in the first week of December um, and I was quite nervous when I went back to see where I'd be at. It was I far behind in terms of fitness and, you know, where was I at? I had a couple of different pains here and there. And, you know, I went back into the club on the Monday. I flew back, was in Sydney Saturday night, went back into the club Monday and they tested me. And straight away, they gave me confidence with the 20 minutes of testing I'd done that I was, you know, far ahead of where anyone should be at that stage. And, you know, I went back into training for December, non-contact. And then in, in January, I think there was one Tuesday night, I had a very bad training on a Saturday and I was struggling because um, I just, certain things I couldn't do that I normally would do and I was struggling to do it. Um, and then, yeah, that Tuesday, I kind of had a moment to myself saying, you know, you're either going to do it now or not. And this is all psychological rather than physical. And I just went into training and, and approached really hard. And it was probably one of the best trainings I had all year. And I knew from that point of view that, yeah, I'm back. And yeah, I suppose from that, that gave me confidence. But again, that was a huge amount of that is down to my strength and conditioning coach. She, she knew the triggers to, to do. And she'd line girls up at training to, to go out and maybe give me an extra bit of attention, you know, without me even knowing. So, you know, a huge amount was down to her. And our first practice match then in the middle of January against the Adelaide Crows, you know, that would, I, I think after one minute, uh, the ball came towards one of the Adelaide players and, you know, I lined her up and tackled her to the ground and got, and got myself a free kick. And I knew from then, yeah, confidence is back. And, you know, I don't think about my leg anymore. That's, you know, that's not thought about at all. You must take enormous satisfaction from that because, listen, you've achieved so much in your career, particularly here in Ireland. But I don't want to keep bringing up the age, but at 37, 38, to have that sort of injury and to get back into, it seems from afar to be playing as well as you've ever played. Like There, there must be enormous personal satisfaction from that. Yeah, there is. Yeah, but I, I, I suppose, yeah, there probably is. I just you, you just probably don't doubt yourself. I don't think of these things. Like people would say to me, oh, you've done very well to come back and all that. Yeah. But... I, I'm a sports person. I'm an athlete. You know, it's what is what's expected. You know, I, if I didn't come back, I'd I'd feel it that it's a failure and that I should have come back. So you know, it's I, I, it's what I expect of myself. It's you know, I, I, yeah. It, maybe in time when I look back and, and you know, I stop I I stop playing sport, that I'll kind of say, yeah, God, that was that was a huge achievement. But like, if I was a coach or a manager or Anthony, and there was a, an athlete that you know done the same. Thing, you know I'd expect him to come back um, you know I suppose I was just very lucky I, I, I said it again if, if it probably happened at home in the GA in Ireland I'd probably struggle to come back it's the resources and and the staff and, and everything that you have over in Australia and, and that probably helped me a little bit more because I wasn't on my own I had someone six days a week helping me to, mm. to get back. Like that's that's frustrating in a way I'm, I'm sure for any ladies Gaelic footballers hearing that and more and more obviously going and the ladies Gaelic football association have obviously made a lot of strides over the last while in, in terms of resources but when you hear the way you were looked after you can't blame anybody any young player from taking that chance no exactly not you know and it's uh, I suppose it's the difference between a, a semi-professional sport and an amateur sport you know mm. I was looked after so well by the club um, you know I wasn't ever out of pocket you know I was looked after financially as well you know it was from that point of view I, I could concentrate and 
do my rehab for five to six days a week for six months. And, you know, if it was here, you'd have to go back to work, stuff like that. So I could put the time into it. Um, I could, you know, put all my energies into rehab and, and I had the people that were going to help me put all my, all my time into it. So, um, you know, from that point of view, it's, it's, it's the difference between, unfortunately, semi-professional and amateur sport. Um, you know, I've, I had my ACL done a, a mm. number of years ago, um, you know, um, playing for Mayo and had to get surgery done. And, and from a point of view, that's going back 10, 10, 12 years ago. And, you know, I was out of pocket from getting my ACL and surgery done because of the way the, the injury fund works with, with ladies football. So, yeah, you can see why young girls growing up now might aspire to try and play some sort of semi-professional sport. And at the moment, AFL or Sevens Rugby are, are probably the only two, or, or soccer in abroad in, in the UK or Europe are probably ones that you can, can play as a semi-professional team sport. Yeah, and there's the difference between semi-professional and amateur and also the way we still treat men's sport and women's sport. Like you talk about you, all right, it's a decade ago, been out of pocket and you look thankfully at the way somebody like Tom Parsons was treated and we thought we'd never see him on a football pitch again, but he goes and he gets the right treatment and he is able to get back and so maybe strides are still being made, but clearly there's always going to be need to be far, far more to be done so that it should be a basic right you would imagine that players that are injured male or female get the exact same treatment yeah exactly and that's what you know you, you, you'd hope people are striding for um you know as i've been a long time playing ladies football and you know there's been massive strides made in the, since you know i started a long long time ago um and and now but i think they need to improve and i think yeah while you're looking to get more attendance at a ladies game and more promotion of the game i i, I think things like um you know expenses for girls going training and you know medical expenses should be top top priority and everything else after that should follow in it's not you know girls going out they want to represent Mayo. i loved every every day i put on the mayo jersey and you know i wouldn't change change it for the world but you know they need to be looked after financially you don't need to be out of pocket and, and girls can't afford you know to be out of pocket if if they get themselves injured playing ladies football or you know for, for traveling to training one thing I was wondering about your, your time in Australia and you're coming in from the outside and I was reading an article, I think it was probably the week or two after you arrived and it was the headline was the best footballer you've never heard of. That you were coming in and people didn't know what Gore Staunton had really achieved, particularly anybody outside of the game, didn't understand what you'd achieved in Ireland. And you're going into a group where there's probably already a natural leadership base and I think you're very much part of that leadership base. How did you find that that you're coming in and you probably led Mayo for almost 20 years at that stage. You've been front and centre, the strong personality that, and maybe, maybe this wasn't the case, but you probably couldn't be that straight away when you landed in Australia, that you needed to work your way in. Was, was that a difficult thing, not being... Uh well, it was probably, well, I, I don't think it was difficult. I actually found it quite refreshing. I, um, I, you know, I went, I went straight to the bottom of the pile um, and, hmm. you know, I had to... You know, I've probably been never in a team um, for, since I was probably 13 or 14 where I had to start to learn to get to know the whole base of the team and nobody knew you. And, um, you know, I suppose with, with Karen O'Connor and Mayo, it's, you know, I've been in the team for a long time and there's girls coming in and, you know, you, you know, majority of the group are the new girls coming in. So, I, you know, I always remember the first day I went to Giants training and I walked in after winning the All-Ireland with Karen O'Connor probably four days later. Um, and I sat in, beside my locker and, and not knowing one person and waiting for someone to come over and talk to me. Um, and probably for the first five weeks that I, I was at, at training for the Giants, I probably barely spoke two or three words, bar, hello, how are you? And as the girls slagged me about it now, they said that you were mute for the first five weeks. And it probably took me five or six weeks to feel any way, any way comfortable in, in general life, prob probably a little bit different off the field. You know, I'm quite shy and, and, and don't really say much if I'm not in comfortable surroundings. So, um, yeah, it was difficult. And I always remember Al, our coach, was very much trying to push me to, to speak more um, in meetings and stuff when I come over first. Obviously, one of the reasons he brought me over was obviously for, for football terms, but also, also for leadership. And, you know, I wouldn't say Anthony any meetings because I didn't feel you know I, I knew the game well enough or I had the right to to do it so it took me a while um to get into it even the first year I probably wouldn't have said that much and you know as I got more comfortable in my surroundings and get to know the girls and you know learn from them and show them that you know I'm I, I go and train and work hard and earn their respect and you know once I had their respect earned I felt then you know maybe I could contribute and 
I suppose that's what I've probably done over the last year and even this year probably more so than any year being in the leadership group over there that I've contributed more off field than on, on field which you know um, for me is it, something I enjoy doing um, but it's also a pleasure and an honour to be you know put into a leadership group that girls you know um, respect you that much that they want you in it. You've obviously got a bit of time now to reflect and contemplate. I'm sure during your injury, you had a, a lot of time as well for, for thinking about things. During that period, did you think a lot about Mayo and, and how it finished up? We obviously covered it in depth at the time. And Peter Lee, he obviously has his opinion of, of what happened. Like, did, did you think about, and are you still very much in the same mindset of, I did the right thing? Or like, are there any regrets at all about how it finished up with Mayo? No, like, uh, number one, I'll answer questions. Like, do I think about it much now? Absolutely no. Um, I suppose once I hit Australia and AFL, and obviously through the injury, you know, you're, you're so uh, focused on trying to get yourself back right and trying to get back yourself back playing. Um, you know, I very little, even when I came back last year, you know, I played a game and a little bit for Carnacone, but I didn't really play very little much football. So all my focus has been on AFL. So I haven't, you know... That the whole obviously playing for Mayo and Mayo has really hasn't been on the front or forefront of my mind, and you know obviously I've retired from playing Mayo football. Uh, around the whole um, scenario and issue that happened that time, no regrets. Um, I'm certainly a person that will never have no regrets. Um, you know I'm I made my decision on the basis of what I thought was right and was done right, and you know that's that that certainly it is. Um, you know as I said I've been lucky. If, had the honour of playing with Mayo for, for 24 seasons and I was lucky enough to, to, to win a couple of All-Irelands with them so you know I'll, my time with Mayo I'll always look back on fondly and you know give me some of the best moments of my life as I did with Carnacone and you know hopefully I can replicate a few more of them with the club before um, I finally hang up the boots. Yeah well when you finally hang up the boots because ordinarily when we would talk to uh, any sports person of a certain age you would ask the retirement question and thinking about what's next uh, knowing you and your personality and, and also the way you're still performing to such a high level, I don't think it would surprise anybody to see you playing at a high level well into your 40. Like, is that something that's something you want or is it, is it in your head at all of, at some stage, I'm going to have to wind this down? Uh, no, yeah, I know. Certainly, I know at some stages in my head I'm going to have to wind this down. And it won't be because I'm not enjoying it. I love it. Um, I think, obviously, being in Australia and playing a different sport is, is probably reinvigorated my love for sport even more and it's it's a different challenge um you know it's one that I'm I'd love to be you know have been a lot younger and tried to play it for a lot longer um you know so that certainly has given me a more life and that's probably why I'm still playing at this age um so I don't think it'll be the enjoyment factor that'll be the reason I, I, I'll stop playing it'll certainly be prob probably because the body will say Do you know what you have enough aches and you have enough um soreness now that you can't keep con continuing on so yeah it'll, it'll certainly be the body that will stop me um you know I'll try and give it back as much as I can to the, to the club um who have, have done so much for me over the the time I've played and you know I certainly like to probably win another county title or two with Cairn and um and, and, and see what we can do after that but um yeah as you know I, I take a day by day and, and enjoy it as much as I can and you know I'd be blessed and lucky that I've played sport for so long and been involved in it and it's certainly given me you know um, so many good things and you know probably the people I've met from it, the friends that I've met and um, certainly is probably been the best thing that it has given me over the last two decades and, and more. Yeah it's hard to imagine you're not involved in sport in some way and you say go back give back to the club whether have you aspirations at some stage to get into coaching or management and or even maybe a, a different side of it, the administration side of it? Because obviously you've seen the other side in Australia now, the professional setup that, you know, having somebody of your your passion and also, I guess, how well known you are to people, like having somebody like that as an advocate for ladies GEA over the coming years could be a, a real boost to the sport. Are, are these things that are in your mind? Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, I'd like obviously in time to to get in, involved in in some sort of way with with sport in 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 my everyday life and my in in work. Um, I, I'd certainly, definitely, yeah, love to get involved in coaching and management. You know, I have done coaching and, and management with the club before. Um, whether it was underage or, you know, I've been training our senior team for for quite a number of years as well. Um, being involved with them. Um, yeah, it's, that's certainly something I'll be involved in. You know, um, it's certainly something I'd like to do on an AFL level as well. Um, 
certainly like to be involved in coaching or mentoring as well. So yeah, there's, you know, I have, you know, I leave everything um, as open as I can, but there will be certainly, yeah, I w- it won't be that I'll just finish up and decide to, to leave sport altogether and definitely be involved in some, in some sort. And, you know, I've done a bit of work with RT and media as well. It's another area that, you know, I love um, being involved in it and, you know, I'll hopefully continue to do that um, over the next few years also. So you're still stuck in isolation then for a, another few days. You said you're doing a bit of reading. What sort of stuff are you reading at the moment? Yeah, I, I, I read, a, read a different number of books. Um, I'm actually reading um, Philly McMahon's book at the moment. I started reading it on the plane on the way home. Um, yeah, so I'm just, yeah, I do a bit of reading and just, um, I actually watch a lot of um, AFL games, men's games now that, you know, the highlights, reels and stuff. So I actually really like watching AFL. Um, yeah, just getting out and about, about doing a bit of cycling and um, just doing, yeah, uh, trying to keep fit and keep the mind active more than anything else. But yeah, yeah, just, you know, just doing a bit of online reading and stuff and keeping up to date with everything. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep myself busy. I won't be sa- sorry when the 14 days mm-hmm. are over. And, you know, hopefully, um, you know, we'll, we'll um, get back to playing uh, sports sometime this year. Looking forward to getting back to playing Kearney Con and training with them whenever that will be. Yeah, a bit of normality. Be welcomed by everybody, I think, at this stage. Uh, just before we finish, Cora, and there's no need to thank me, I put you on our Mayo Mount Rushmore. First name up on Mount Rushmore for Mayo. And there's been a lot of feedback, as you can imagine, online uh, to it, to the four names. There was not one person questioned your inclusion, uh, you'd be glad to know, on our Mayo Mount Rushmore. There were some questions over Kevin Gilban and over Kieran MacDonald, part of the Imagine, and Lee McHale. Uh, I don't know if you know if you think I got it right. Listen, we're, you're you're 100 on it, so there's only three spaces left in Cora's Mayo Mount Rushmore. Who do you have up there? Oh God, I probably alongside go from, you. Uh, alongside me, I'd probably have to go for mostly GA players. Um, you know, because obviously uh, I know there's been big debate whether um, Martin Sheridan um, mm. should have been on it, but obviously that's. Um, a long, long time ago, and you know, person obviously I wouldn't remember. But if it, if it was if it was based off my era, um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be probably based off probably based off all GA players, and yeah, certainly Kieran McDonald would be up there, and um, probably my favourite Mayo player of all time. Um, after that, I'd probably have to put in Andy Moran as well. Um, another great stalwart for Mayo has done t- done tremendous work. Um, um. And God, my fourth spot. Who would I put? Um, yeah, it's it's a difficult it's not one. Easy. It's uh, not easy. It's, it's certainly not easy. Um, I would probably, I would probably put a I'd probably put yeah the likes of Lee McHale, um, someone like that as well. But that's just all GA GA based and and from my ear or watching from watching football. No, that's fine. It's fine. You've agreed with two of my three selections, and Andy Bourne was very unlucky not to get in. It must be, uh, listen, I, 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 again, I can't imagine your personality to be as successful as you are by, by listening to too much of the noise, but that when conversations like this come up, if there's no quibbles about you being on that list. It, it, you probably don't allow yourself to take the time to think about just how loved you are by so many people in Mayo. No, I suppose, uh, as I said, when you're a sports person, all you're looking for, looking to, uh, is towards the next challenge, and you know, how you can make yourself better, um, whether it's in the, the GA space or for me now, it's in the AFL space. You're trying to improve all the time and look back at your last performance and, you know, what you're doing well and what you didn't do well. But, yeah, you know, it's obviously, it's, it's, I'm very humbled and, and honoured to, to, you know, to be mentioned in, in, in the breadth of one of, some, one of the best uh, Mayo people, sports persons. Uh, you know, I believe I'm, I'm probably not up there yet. There's a lot more better than me, but um, yeah, it's, it's humbling and especially more humbling when there's female that's, that's also on it. Yeah. So you took Kevin Kilban off. We'll inform him of that decision and you replace him with Andy Moran. Uh, expect a call over the coming days. <laughs> Corey, I will. Been... I'm very sorry, Kevin. <laughs> you've been brilliant with your time. Uh, mind yourself. Uh, enjoy, if you can, your last couple of days of isolation. We hope you get